Thank you, Judge Spurlock, for uh, agreeing to share your experiences and insight with us today. So um, I'll just get started. We'll dig in with the questions, I suppose. All right, thank you. And let me just say, first of all, uh, this is Chuck Hill, who's a former student here. When we were Texas Wesleyan, now we're Texas A&M School of Law. And it's an honor for me to sit here with you today, Chuck. Well, well I appreciate it. To take part in this project. And likewise, I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you. So, Let's start from the, well, from the beginning, relatively speaking, I guess. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to become an attorney? An uh, interesting uh, thought. Uh, growing up as a child here in Fort Worth, going to school, my dad was a lawyer, and his uncle had been a lawyer, Otis Rogers. He was a famous criminal lawyer in Fort Worth. And dad's father, uh, who was sheriff of Throckmorton County, had been a lawyer. And uh, then my father, Joe Spurlock. A lawyer so I was raised in a lawyer family and I'd always kind of had an interest in the law and I say going to school all of my friends always assumed I'd be a lawyer and I always swore I wasn't going to be a lawyer I'm nice to know lawyers but I was going to be an archaeologist or an anthropologist or and then later I was going to be a soldier and jump out of airplanes and eat snakes but I wasn't going to be a lawyer so uh, it seemed like I fought it most of my life but everybody else always thought I would be Maybe because I was voluble. That is, I talked a lot. So that's it. <laughs> it's kind of something I never set out to do. Okay. So was there anybody in particular that inspired you? Obviously, your I assume your father inspired you. Um, how about once you got into practice? Was there anybody in particular that inspired you while you were practicing? There have been a lawyer, surely. And being raised, as, say, in a lawyer family, we, we read all the literature or books about lawyers. Dad would mention them. And so I, I read most of the typical books. I was a pretty avid reader otherwise and understood pretty much what the law was. But more than being a lawyer, I think I was cut out for politics. And at that time, uh, growing up in pre-World War II and then World War II Texas and then living into it later on, uh, politics then was generally managed by the attorneys, literally, more, more so than it probably is now, more, more populist located now than it was in those days and so if you were a lawyer everybody thought you would naturally be a politician or they assumed that all politicians were lawyers I mean one one way or the other and so I started in the age of four I can remember the early stages out on Camp Bowie putting matches and putting flyers under people's windshield wipers on their own cars I'd have to jump up to reach up there and do it so starting in street-level politics, working in political campaigns and stuffing letters and licking envelopes and cut my tongue and lips and then someone said, oh, you can use a sponge for that. And the greatest thing ever invented for politics <laughs> was a sponge so you could moisten the, the lip of the envelope and something you'd stuffed and mailed it. So I, I learned that, learned politics, say, from the grassroots up and learned about public speaking too. I remember going out to Mansfield in the old days, really, in the late 30s and early 40s where there were remember we, we used to have then the primaries were in late summer so they were in July and it's very hot in Texas in July so we would go out there earlier in July to make campaign speeches and literally they were stump speeches and what we mean is they either had a carton or they had milk cartons or they had a literally stumps that people would get on to speak, and it was in the evening. There was no air conditioning and nothing. So they were in the evening, and I remember being out there with pickup trucks and cars in big circles around a stump in the center, and guys getting up on the stump, and they were mostly men, they were not women then, making speeches at night in the light of people's head, headlights of their pickup trucks and their cars. And that was politics to me, and I thought, you know, that's pretty fun, stand out in the middle of all that and get to make a talk. And then later, the, my mother was Fort Worth's first city councilwoman. She was elected in 1952 to the city council of Fort Worth, beat the incumbent mayor and one other. And that, I thought everybody's mom was in politics. I didn't know, but she was the first woman in all of North Texas to be elected to public office. So I kind of had a family like that. So it was always politics in which I was interested. And at that time, as I said, be a good politician, generally they were lawyers. So that kind of the two things that went along with, well, I'm going to go in politics, probably need to follow a, a legal career. So you had set your sights on politics early on and 
Right. Practicing law was a means to an end. A means to do that. I see. So, I mean, I'm more out to save the world in that sense. I mean, a lot of folks do because I'm a law professor now. And, and I know a lot of people have great ideas and they have a burning desire, something in them to make them want to help society and improve it. I, I, I'm, I was more crass than that, I suppose. I, I was just, it looked like an interesting thing to do. So now you practiced for a time after you, after you came back from Vietnam with the yes. DA's office, is that correct? Yes, I did. I, um, a little bit of practice before I went into military service and then, because I got out of law school in 62 <coughs> and we entered the military in early 63 and then went four years to, I mean, three years to Alaska and then a year to Vietnam. And when I came back, I did go to the DA's office for about three and a half years here in Tarrant County. So I was a prosecutor and at that time we were able to practice law at the same time. We were not limited just to prosecution. You could you could also be an attorney on the side. So I was a member of two or three different law firms at that time in while I was in the DA's office. And so what prompted you at that point in the early 70s to decide to run for the legislature? I'd always wanted to be in the legislature. Uh, I understood what that was like and I had known legislators most of my life because they were politicians and Lyndon Johnson was a family friend of course so I knew about Lyndon and Congress and Jim Wright uh, from Fort Worth who was later Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and my dad were close friends and the story is they flipped a coin to see who would run when that Senate seat Jim Wright first held the 12th Congressional District of Texas came open Jim Wright and Dad were both pretty much the same, good political people and ready to buy for it in 1948. And the story goes they flipped a coin and Jim won, so Dad did not run. Dad says, well, no, they cut cards for it. But <laughs> between the two of them, they remained very good friends, and so I'd known Jim Wright and politicians like that. Well, when I got out of A&M and went to the University of Texas School of Law as a brand new Aggie graduate, um, I wanted to do something. Law school was interesting, but there were, it just didn't occupy my time. After A and M, the four years of the core, I mean, I felt bored with just law school. So I wanted to do something, and the something I found wound up doing was working for a state representative from Tarrant County. And my name was Red Cowan, and Red was a uh, he had no legs, and he got around in a wheelchair and had his own car, and he needed an aide. So I interviewed, and Red hired me. He was a Fort Worth politician and uh, so for the, that year 1961 and into 62 special sessions I was Red's aide down in the legislature. Now Red kind of had a habit, you had to know Red to understand. He later became a county clerk, served 10 years as Tarrant County clerk. But Red liked to leave every day around one o'clock. I mean Red, Red got tired early so Red would leave early and he would say you know keep me Keep me straight, Joe. Vote me right. Keep me with Jim Nugent, or keep me with Bill Heatley, or keep me with Jim Slidle, or Jerry uh, Jerry Slidle. People I knew that he trusted to keep his voting record straight. So I would help Red to get in his car and tell him adios and go out and sit on the floor of the house as a uh, 1L or 2L over at the University of Texas School of Law. I'm sitting there voting the machine. I, you know, I voted what Red wanted. It wasn't anything vile. I was just Red's alter ego sitting there for him, and I knew who to follow, and if I didn't vote right, they'd come over and smack me in the face and tell Red, and I'd be fired. So, But I, it got in my blood, the idea of being a representative and that, that responsibility that you have. And I'm not knocking Red for this because I'm just trying to say Red physically probably was not feeling as well as he could at that time and so I, he entrusted me to do that and I loved it and it got in my blood in 61 so I had an opportunity because Red was running for a county clerk in 62 and I was told by several of the Fort Worth movers and shakers Joe you need to run for Red seat we'll, we'll help you get elected because I was graduating from law school and I said well you know I've got you know deferred from A&M I owe a two-year commitment to the United States Army, and I need to go in the Army and, and get that done. And they said, no, no, once you go in there as a legislator, you'll be exempt, and, and you'll never have to serve. And I didn't feel right about that, so I went. And I went on in service and didn't run in 62. Well, a, 
young man did, a kid, a friend of mine, we'd been at Poly High together, and I helped him learn politics. His name was Hugh Palmer. Well, Hugh did run in 62 and, and took a red seat and served one term, and I went off and spent, I say, four years in the Army and then came back three and a half years in DA's office before I could run for re-election again, or run for election and get to the legislature. So I got there uh, January of 1971. And that was how I got into it. got in my blood through Red Cowan in 1961. And then because of the way circumstances were, it took me 10 years to get back there. But I did, which I wanted to do. So what did you enjoy the most about being in the legislature? Just the, the, just the thrill, the sheer enjoyment of doing that. You're really making law. You're making law. And I was sitting there, I remember when I came home one day, and, and my wife, I dearly loved at the time, She's passed away since then. She looked at me one day and she said, I just realized you're making my law. <laughs> so now as a husband, you have to be, I guess the husband appreciate how wives can really put you down in your place. And I got thinking, I said, well, yeah, I am. Yours and everybody else's. And she said, that never occurred to me. <laughs> so that sort of concept has a way of reducing you back to the normal world that you're living. But other than that, it's a heady thing to be down there. Politics is a heady thing to be in. To be, to be elected to something, and then after a while, though, the reality of the job sets in, and that did. And the reality of being a legislator is that you're wined and dined, there's parties all the time, they're after you all the time, everyone wants this and that and the other. It grinds on a person. It ground me down. I even had a heart attack in the start of my second term. And so I was 17 days in Harris Hospital where I got to think through my life being a lawyer, burning a candle at both ends, being a legislator, having a family with two kids, and I need to do something else in life. I was on my way to be Speaker of the House, I thought, or on my way to, to run for Governor of Texas, which is what I always planned to do. Governor of Texas after our Speaker of the House and then go for the U.S. Senate. That was always in the back of my mind, but when I had that heart attack at age 34, God has a way of talking to you was kind of a, a, an impression to me, Joe, maybe you need to do something different. Mm -hmm. So from there, I, I then set up on a judicial path, which wound me up eventually on the Court of Appeals. Now, how did you become, how did, how did it come about that you ended up being the judge of the 231st? I, uh, when I was in the legislature, which I served from 71 through 76, in 1976, I decided to run for um, one of the benches in Tarrant County, and it was Criminal District Court Number Two. There was a judge on it, Dutch Winters, a good guy, known judge, Dutch. But I'd been a prosecutor. I prosecuted in his court and prosecuted in Byron Matthews, Criminal District Court Number One. And I knew Dutch, and Dutch was older at that time. I mean, I'm 77 now, but Dutch, my gosh, he must have been at least old, say 70. So he's an old guy. <laughs> but uh, Dutch's health was not that good, and everyone expected Dutch to retire. I mean, he probably shouldn't have retired. And and I went to talk to him. I said, uh, Judge Winters, I'm I'm you know I'm going to run for the judiciary. I want to get on the bench. Now my dad was a district judge by then. He was elected a district judge in 1968 and went on the Tarrant County bench, the 96th district court in 1969. Dad. Went court, 6th uh, Tarrant County, 96th District. So I had I'd known that, and, and so this was in 76, and, and I knew Dutch, and, and he said, he said, Joe, I'm probably going to retire. He said, I'll let you know. Well, I'd not already made my announcement. I wasn't going to run for the legislature, and and I this was in late 75. I wasn't going to run for the legislature, and I kept waiting, and time started getting closer, and Politics, timing's everything. So if, if you don't uh, announce at the right time and you don't do something, then, then stuff happens bad. So I just seized a bull by the horns. I thought, in my mind, you know, Dutch is not going to run. So I announced for the 96, I mean, the uh, uh, second criminal district court number two of Tarrant County and made my announcement and said I wasn't going to run for the legislature because I'd had to file for my seat if I was going to run. And I uh, had several page article, you know, in the press and the Fort Worth Star Telegram about not running and then going to run for the bench and wasn't running against Dutch Winter. I was running for what I thought was an open court. Well, made Dutch angry. It, it really did. 
because I didn't wait and, and give him the right to, to, to say something. So he decided to run, and he did. And Dutch ran, and he beat me. So my first political race I ever lost was against Dutch winners as a district court judge. And actually, it's a very interesting uh, process. We were all Democrats then. There was only one party, but there were two sections. There was a liberal Democrat and the conservative Democrat. And uh, I was going after the conservative vote. So in 76, I was chairman of the statewide commission on crime and its control, and we recommended 17 bills to the legislature that later in 1977 they passed. First was the first wiretap law in Texas. The other was the uh, oral confession videotape law in Texas and all this other stuff, which I was out law and order, campaigning, let go for a lot. Criminal district court, I thought that's what you do. Same time Dutch Winters was out, he had a bail bondsman driving him around to all of the neighborhoods. At that time, they were, they were still black and white communities and all the black neighborhoods and all the other neighborhoods, having a vote for Dutch and I'd go to the, the black churches just like Dutch would because at that time, politicians, you always went to speak in, in, these, in these minority churches, and you spoke from the pulpit. Everybody did. I mean, we're only one party. And we're all Democrats. We're all Southern Democrats. We're all Southern Christian Democrats. <laughs> I mean, we're, whether we're black or we're white, we've got the same pattern. So, you know, and so you speak up there, and then first thing you do is, of course, you put your money in the collection plate before anybody else does. I mean, politics is real people. That's all I'm telling you. And so we were doing that, and I'd do that, and Dutch would do that, and went everywhere. And then the chairman of what was then called the Black Precinct Workers Council that always supported my dad in his races and, and supported me before in the legislature, they came to me and said, Joe, we're going to have to put Judge Winters on our slate card, because you had slate cards that were named. All organizations had their own slate of people they wanted elected, and they made slate cards. And I said, well, I understand that. You know, he's an incumbent, Joe, and, and you know what we do. And I said, yes, sir, I know that. So you've always been friends with my dad, though. Yeah, I know, and your dad never ran against anybody who was an incumbent. <laughs> and so I, I got it. I understand it. And they said, oh, by the way, though, we would sure like a contribution from you. <laughs> so I did. And Dutch beat me uh, by an, about two votes for every precinct in, in the deal. Well, I said we were one party. But that morning of the, of the primary election in, I think, May of 1976, that was the first year that we ever had a presidential preference primary in Texas. And that time, Lord Benson, it was Lloyd Benson, but he wanted to be the favorite son from Texas for the Democrats. So he created, and when we were in the legislature in 75, he had a bill passed where we would set a presidential preference primary had to do it so the parties could hold that in the primary. Well, the Republicans thought it was a good idea and got on it themselves. And they had an old actor from Hollywood <laughs> named Ronnie Reagan, who was up on the Republican Party to be a presidential preference primary from Texas. He wasn't even the national candidate yet. He was just a, an old boy from Hollywood, you know, they wanted to put on. Remember the morning of the primary election, I'd worked hard, I campaigned hard against Dutch, and he campaigned hard against me, and it's hard to run a judicial race, because what do you say about the incumbent? Nothing, bro. What do you say about yourself? I'm better than him, and that's about it. So we campaigned hard, and that morning of the election, I started getting phone calls about 7.05, polls open at 7 o'clock. Joe, you better get down here. Your name's not on the ballot. What the hell's going on? What do you mean it's not <laughs> on the ballot? These are my campaign workers calling me concerned because I'm not on the ballot. And they look for it. I said, well, where are you? What are you doing? We're down, down here. What's going on? Well, we came down to vote for you and Ronnie Reagan. I said, me and Ronnie Reagan? Wait a minute, wait. you're in a Republican Party primary. And they'd say, what's that? Campaign workers didn't know what a primary or Republican Party. We had in Texas been so long a one-party state. People just went to vote in a primary. They didn't know primary versus the general election. Nobody cared. These are campaign workers. These are intelligent, you know, people that know what they're doing, quote, unquote. And they're wanting to vote for Ronnie Reagan. Well, you couldn't do that in a primary. You had to go to the Republican Party primary if you want to vote for Ronnie Reagan and to the Democratic Party primary if you want to vote for old Joe, and you can't do both. Right. 
Now, the general election, people every day now, they understand the general election. They got it. Then, folks didn't. Now, I'm not saying that's why I lost, but I really lost to Ronnie Reagan. <laughs> so, in that sense, that was only 1976. And, of course, then later he became president of the United States. And, and, and Lord Benson did not. I call him Lord because that's kind of the way he uh, is Lloyd Benson, a good guy. But he kind of had that that royal regal <laughs> attitude as, as a state senator. And, uh, I, man, I've always liked but But Lloyd Benson uh, carried the Democratic Party um, nomination, but neither one of them did anything that year in 1976. So I got beat by... Uh, Dutch winners, and uh, no, no way about it. I can spin it any way I want to, but I got beat. So that next morning, I'm awake. It, here it is, May in '76, and I got no job. I didn't run for the legislature. I quit that. I'm noble enough. I was going to go be a judge. Well, I need a job. Well, the governor uh, at that time reached down, uh, uh, Dolph Briscoe, and offered me a job, which turns out to be an excellent job called veto man. Uh, that's actually counsel to the governor what it was at that time. The idea was you go down, you handle his legislative programs, you work with the House and the Senate, you decide whether or not uh, he should back certain bills or not, or he tells you he wants to back a bill, and you look at the history and background of it. And then at the end of the session, you've either tried to get members of the House and Senate to go along with the governor's program and amend things his way, or change bills he doesn't like that they have, to comport with what the governor thinks, because remember, the governor's one third in the executive branch of government, and they have a lot of viewpoints in that governor's office about what's good and bad legislation. So, uh, veto man for the governor, I make speeches for the governor all over the state. It's the alter ego of the governor with regard to the legislature. And so I got that pretty heady appointment. Didn't build a castles with it or anything. Uh, he offered me a shot at an appointment to a court. So I took it, and I, the courts we created, we created them in April of 77, and I took the bench of the 231st in September 1st of 1977. So it was a brand new created court at that time, 231st District Court in Tarrant County. So actually, I went on the bench only from January 1st to September 1st, which is eight months. Eight months later, that route than I would have gone if I'd gone on the criminal district court. But instead of being in criminal district court, I was now in a family district court, which I much preferred anyway. So what was it that attracted you to, to family law? Real problems that real people have. I mean, literally the issues about uh, caring for kids, the conservatorship questions. The, in the legislature, I did a lot on some of the, ju the judicial committees I was on with regard to family law issues and family issues, and I always cared about that. It, uh, how parents make all divorce cases and most conservatorship cases be about them. That's just human nature. And somewhere the kids are always lost in that problem. So that had always bothered me and I was always concerned about, as we say, the kids. And then also about uh, the issues, the legal issues in, in family areas, both in, in formation of marriages, then in acquisition of property and in our community property state. We're very different from the majority of the states. We have very different issues in there. And then, as I say, the children's issues in all family cases. And we want to make sure we could try to create some real voice for kids within divorce cases. Not to put parents down. I mean, parents are just acting out what's human nature. You know, and, and, and at the same time, though, kids get lost in these things and kids get messed up and, and I don't know, all this issue. So, boys was interested in. In fact, I remember when. I told the governor, I said, I'd like one of the courts we would create. I said, Governor, I work for you. I see you every day, you know, hours of the day, late at night and everything. I don't want you to think every time you see me I'm going to ask you for something, but I'm going to say one time to you if it's all right, Governor. I said, we're creating a lot of new courts, and I want one of them there in Tarrant County. And he looked at me, and he said, well, he said, I know. He said, I was thinking about that. I'm going to give you the thinking about that 236 district court, civil district court. I said, Governor, I don't want that. You don't? I said, I'd like to have the 231st family district court. Whatever for? 
<laughs> the governor had been told by people, the silk stocking lawyers, as we always call them, the, the, the big corporate lawyers and all, they always frowned at family courts because who wants pots and pans? And good lawyers wouldn't touch it, just like good lawyers wouldn't touch the criminal practice. I mean, we don't want to soil our hands, you know. I'm knocking my lawyer buddies. But there's, there's a lot of that attitude and air in, in lawyering. We don't do family law and we don't do criminal law. We only do law law. Well, I didn't want to do law law. It bored me to death. I want to do family law. The governor said, you really want the family court? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I don't know. I'll let you know. And of course, we went on law. We created the courts and went along. I didn't hear a word. He was off in uh, D.C. in the middle of May. And he sent a telegram back from D.C. announcing my appointment and for two or three others in Tarrant County. He didn't even tell me to my face. He just sent it by by a telegram from Washington D.C. So promotion by telegram. Yeah, promotion by <laughs> telegram. And I was sitting there I, where I worked. There was a little hallway downstairs in the basement of the Capitol. Myself and the secretary in the hallway. He turned it into a little room. And the, and the captains of industry found that hallway though. They knew where the heck I was. All the lobbies. They found me down there. But the secret to that hallway was out outside the hallway around a wall partition. On the back side is an elevator, and that elevator goes from that basement of the Capitol, which we call the ground floor, two floors up to the governor's office, into his office. And so that's the little get-out elevator that you need the governor to flip out to the basement and get out of the building and be gone. And that elevator was right there, 10 feet from me, and then around the wall about 20 feet from where I was. And so I'm down there in the basement, and it's a nondescript little hallway down and there, there I sit, and upstairs, right up there, is the governor's office. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't have me up to do that. He had to send me a telegram. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I loved the time, and I loved it with the governor Briscoe and with him and his wife Janie too. They were super people, and uh, taught me a lot about about government and about how it, how it really works. So after serving um, on the family bench for how many years? Uh, Five and a half, almost six years. So at that point, then you got appointed to the Second Court of Appeals. Is that correct? Right. Yes, I had wanted to be on the Court of Appeals. I mentioned my dad was a district court judge in the ninety-sixth district court, and he went on the Court of Appeals in nineteen seventy-five while I was in the legislature. It's rather interesting. The Court of Appeals at that time was very primitive by today's standards. Uh, they didn't have copy machines, so. Through me, he asked, and through the Tarrant County delegation, we made sure they got enough funds to get a copy machine at the court. And we actually took up a collection of materials and stuff, and I took them up to the second <laughs> court. So they had paper, a reams of paper, and pencils, and carbons, and all the regular things that offices were run on them. But I mean, they were primitive times in the Court of Appeals, and that was 75. And then when I went on, uh, 1977 into the 231st District Court. Dad was on the Court of Appeals, so I kept up with him and uh, friends of his that were on there, and I'd known a lot of the old, old lawyers in Fort Worth who were on the courts at that time. And I got interested in the Court of Appeals, and then Dad was thinking about leaving the court, but he wasn't sure. And so in 1981, when I was on the 231st, we, and, and I say we because I was on Texas Judicial Council at that time, we decided and proposed to the legislature, and they adopted it, that we change the courts of appeals, intermediate courts of appeals, so that they would take criminal cases. At that time, courts of appeals were called the courts of civil appeals. They took only appellate cases and civil cases. All criminal cases went direct from a trial court to the Court of Criminal Appeals which means the Court of Criminal Appeals was overwhelmed because all of the trial courts in Texas were sending all their criminal cases direct. So we convinced that part of the Judicial Council's program was to convince the legislature, and they changed it, to go send criminal court cases, intermediate court cases, everything except for death penalty cases, send them up to the intermediate courts of appeals, which we would change from courts of civil appeals to courts of appeals, which which the people did, and I think there's a constitutional amendment in there somewhere, but they did, and the legislature did, and at that time then, they doubled the size of the larger courts. The Fort Worth Court of Appeals went from three judges to six judges. So there were three new appointments going to come available in 1981. 
Well, a lot of folks were interested in me going there, and I was interested in being an appellate judge. Sure. I mean, at that time, it was considered a real promotion. And so I kind of asked around and talked around a little bit and even got an interview with the governor. And what the real bite was, my dad was on the court, and that would put me and my dad on the court at the same time. And people thought, well, that's not right to have a father and son on the same court at the same time. And any t I'll tell you, in politics, anytime they can get anything on you, any reason, then of course you, you fight that, that fictional dog instead of whether you're the best qualified person, you fight whatever the baggage that they're sticking on you. And I was having to do with that and I went down to talk to the governor and the governor at that time was Governor Clements and talking to Governor Clements about it and, and to his people and they said, well, you know, Joe, we make a requirement that if I'm appointing people that you have to run as a Republican. Will you do that? I said, well, no, Governor, I can't do that. It'd, that'd, that'd be a disgrace to you and me both. Everybody knows I can't run as a Republican. I can't say the R word. You know? <laughs> so I, I said that that would demean your character. And, I mean, it, it, would, it, it would make a lie out of everything for me to say I'm running, changing, changing my stripe, as it were, to become a Republican just to serve on a court. And, Governor, I can't do that. I don't want to diminish you or me either. I understand that, Joe. Let me ask you this. Are you going to run against one of my appointees? I said, well, Governor, if you appoint a hack, yeah, some political hack, I sure will. But if you appoint a good lawyer, someone that has credence in the community, and you do what, what the community or the bar thinks you should do, I don't care what label you put on them, if they're a good lawyer, no, I'm not going to run against anyone. He appointed three good people. And uh, Dixon Holman was one of them, a very good guy who later served himself. Mm -hmm. Another was uh, Brown, I can't remember his first name, but from Brown, Herman, Scott, Dean, and Young of that family here in Fort Worth. An excellent man. So Dixon Holman, Brown, and uh, Walter Jordan, who was 48th District Court, been a friend of my dad's for years and one of mine. And Walter was an excellent judge. So he put Walter on there and, and uh, Mr. Brown and then also Dixon Holman. So I didn't run. And then later, though, in uh, late 1982, a year later, Dad decided he was going to retire off the court. His health wasn't as good as he wanted it to be. And I talked to Dad, and, and uh, Dad said, I'm going to retire. I'm going to ask the governor. And so Dad was retiring, and he did retire early. He retired before January. He retired sometime in late November. And Governor Clements appointed him to Dad's position. So, I mean, with the understanding, I don't have to run as a Republican now. This is not one of the three new ones. Right. Those people have gone into office on uh, 82, I think January of 82. They went into office special election. So, anyway, so then Dad's not going to be on it, and I've been appointed, and, but I didn't take the oath of office because I had rumors around here that the young man I mentioned earlier took my place with Red Cowan, uh, Hugh Farmer, had become quite a good politician by then, and Hugh had been elected senator. And uh, word got out that uh, Hugh was going to reject my appointment. Now, this guy had been to Park High School with him, and Hugh Farmer's Mr. Democrat. We all understand it. He worked for Jim Wright, uh, my dad's friend, and Hugh was still a friend of mine. And I said, Hugh, why? You know, it's a matter of principle, Joe. You're appointed by a governor for the Republican Party. And I said, you, Mark White's going to reappoint me because Mark had just beaten Clements. Mm -hmm. And Mark White had been Secretary of State when I worked for Briscoe. White and I were number two lawyer, one and two lawyers for Briscoe, worked together. David Dean was the other one who's very big in the still Republican Party politics today, but David went off into Republican Party politics. So David Dean and Mark White and I were triumphant working for Dolph Briscoe, and Mark was going to reappoint me, I was pretty sure. And um, But Hugh said it's a matter of principle. So he did. So it went back. I didn't take the oath of office. It went back to the governor's office, rejected by the Senate, by Hugh Palmer, and they pulled it back. Mark reappointed me a week later, because <laughs> I knew he would, and Mark was a good friend. I had no fix in him. Never given Mark a nickel, but Mark reappointed me. And so when I went down for my um, interview, I, all the guys I met down there were all senators I'd either served in the House with on the Senate Confirmation Committee or that I had been Governor Briscoe's veto man handling their stuff earlier. So it was not a problem. And Hugh, just, 
I don't know that he even till today understands that, how politics works sometimes, although he's a very astute politician, but I just, you know. But as a result, I've wound up the only judge that I know of I was appointed to the same appellate court by a governor of the Republican Party and a governor of the Democratic Party to the same main bench. There may be others, but I don't know of any. And, uh, and, and both Mark White and Briscoe have had a, a hell of a campaign against each other. First one in the world that spent, I think, close to $60 million between the two of them. That's the reported money. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, it, 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 I don't, it worked. I got on the court. And, of course, the same argument was, well, you know, it's one Spurlock replacing another. We're not gaining anything. Uh, it didn't matter to me. I just wanted to be on there, and I enjoyed it. And I stayed on that court nine years. On the second court of appeals, where we're today. So, were you inspired by your dad to pursue that position? Or? Essentially, that plus many others. I knew I mentioned Walter Jordan. Another was W. A. Hughes, who had been a judge up in Decatur, Wise County. I had the greatest respect for W. A. And he was on there. And old Judge Langdon, as we used to call Jack Langdon, who had been a judge when I was growing up in Fort Worth, was on the Court of Appeals ahead of Dad. Jack Langdon was one. Uh, Harris Brewster, whose brother was was a federal district judge, and Harris Brewster was on the second Court of Appeals. I knew him, and Tom Renfro had been Chief Justice on the Court of Appeals, and I grew up around Tom and knew Tom Renfro because he was a friend of Dad's. All these guys were friends of Dad because they were lawyers first used to be in the old days, you had to be a, really a lawyer to get on the Court of Appeals. And I was one of the first, I suppose I could say, really non-lawyers who got on. I mean, I was a lawyer, but I wasn't a silk-stocking, practicing lawyer. Well, Dad was one of the first trial lawyers that ever got on there in the sense that Dad was a plaintiff's attorney, that dreaded word. <laughs> but uh, Dad was one of the first plaintiff's attorneys that got on there. Most of the others had been corporation lawyers, what we call transactional attorneys or something. But Dad was a true trial lawyer. I mean, and so he was, because he was a politician first, trial lawyer, and then lawyer second. But he inspired me. But then all these other men I knew, men of quality within the bar, uh, and I say, and I'm not anything like them, but I aspired to be like them. Tom Renfro, Harris Brewster, uh, uh, say W.A. Hughes even, Walter Jordan, Dad. Uh, they were people I wanted to be around, that I really, really, really wanted to be associated with. And I, as a relative young man at that time, had a shot at being around some of the people that had been in my radar as, as people that I idolized is the wrong word, but people I deeply respected in the law. And I wanted to be around them and got to be. Got to be in the inner circles and wow, that was something. It was, it was always a hoot to me. It's just like even teaching law now every day is still a hoot. This whole idea of being in where, where we're now teaching people who want to be formative in the sense of developing the law in the future, having some way of input into what they do and how they do it, um, never never ceases to excite me. Still does. So after having a pretty diverse career, serving in the legislature, serving on a trial bench, how did you go about learning the job of being an appellate judge? It's, it's quite different, isn't it? Watching them. Oh, yeah. For that reason, again, when you're a trial judge, you're in charge. You know, it's jury go to the jury room, a counsel approach the bench, overrule, sustain, you know, take a recess now. I mean, you, you, you do things, you run it. When you get to the appellate court, you're a member of a committee, literally, just like doing committee work. And you work in your little cloister by yourself <laughs> with your clerk, and you work on all the stuff, and then you meet, and you have committee work. And remember the first time that I ever went to oral hearings, and then we were following back, I was on a panel with uh, Judge Jordan and W.A. Hughes. And W.A. Hughes was the head of the panel, and Judge Jordan was there, Walter Jordan and myself. First, we knew cases. By then, we drew cases by a lot, and I knew what cases I was going to have to write on. And I had my stuff written, ready, because I was ready for, for, for the oral argument, and I was ready to go with the counsel afterwards and talk about the cases and how we discuss these and develop what we're going to do. And I was there. I was prepared, and W.A. Hughes said, well, Joe, I know it's the first case this year. I said, yes, sir. And uh, Walter Jar was there, well, let's hear it. So I started, I opened it up like you're going to make an oral argument to the court. I opened up the things I'd prepared, my arguments, and the way I thought the case ought to go, and I was all, started to read it to him. 
what you're charging after about, I don't know, 15 or 20 words. So just a minute, Joe. He said, W.A., I've got an opinion here affirming the case. He said, Joe, if you'd like to look at it, I'll, I'll get it to you. I said, well, I want to talk. He said, well, if you want to dissent, I suppose you can. And W.A. said, well, let's get to the next case, Walter. So welcome to the world of appellate law. I mean, literally, most, maybe I'm telling too much about the courts, but <laughs> that was the young man myself. I was, I was nine years after 39, so I was 48, I guess, when I went, no, wait, maybe not. No, yeah, five and a half years after 39, I was 40, something in my early 40s, but there I was in the Court of Appeals, and I was all ready to, to, to convince my mm -hmm. two brethren, and Walter Jordan already had an opinion on that case. <laughs> written. You know, and if I wanted to dissent, I was welcome to. So he wasn't put down. It was just, it was just introduction. You know, you're the rookie and okay, we got it. And so here's what we're going to do. And that helped me understand early on about appellate law. Yeah, if you've got something you're really passionate about, then you need to work people. And I began to work the court like you work a committee in the legislature. I mentioned mm -hmm. committee work. I didn't realize that at first. I'd been too long an independent judge, where judges rule, and you're, you're a king in your fiefdom and all of this stuff. And here I was back on a committee, just like the legislature, where you have to go convince your, your fellow workers in the House or the Senate of the merit of your bill, mm -hmm. and you work them individually and make sure you can get their vote before you get to the committee or before you get to the floor or anywhere else. And then you have to go and do it in the other house. Here, at least in the appellate court, if you're passionate about something, you only have to convince yourself plus enough to make more than half of the rest of the court, yeah. and you can carry the day. So it's not like you got to get them all. You've got to get more than half. And um, it taught me a lesson. It taught me that, 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 that appellate court work is committee work, literally. It's not where you're one person's a shining star and everyone else falls at your feet. They're all on the appellate court. Come on. Everybody's <laughs> history is about the same. So you're all equal. There may be a chief justice, but even so, the chief justice is generally an administrative mm -hmm. official. So and it's, it's administration they're dealing with. And, and all the problems with the secretaries or the briefing attorneys or getting the budget in or all that kind of stuff is not having to do with pushing or swaying legislation. That, that's the mind of the people that, that sit around that table. So I learned that lesson. First day. <laughs> that I was back in the committee. So what was the most rewarding aspect of working on the Court of Appeal? Getting some things done, it, literally getting some cases decided that uh, were very interesting cases that were complicated cases or that where we made the law go in one way or the other. Um, and I, you know, those sorts of things I remember working on and, and there was a great pleasure in that. Ninety percent of appellate work is just uh, approving what the trial court did. Because the reversible errors are few and far between, really. Most judges, uh, and you get some judges that you know are gonna be critical problems, trial judges, because they won't listen, they don't pay attention. And they don't pay attention to their jobs, and they're not either there on time, or they don't do it well, or they, they're lackadaisical, or they're lazy, or slothful, and you think, well, judges shouldn't be that. Well, they are, unfortunately, like people. So you have those judges which present problems. Sometimes it's the nature of the case itself will present a real problem. Most of the time, no. Appellate work is purity humdrum. I mean, it's, and that was the thing about it. I got bored to tears as an appellate court judge. Just it wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my thing. I got bored in the legislature, too. I mean, after a while, it was all, all my questions had become, well, why not? I mean, because there was so little that was being done, how come we can't do it this time? And I got tired of being the voice beating against the wall down there. I found that in both ways, both in, both in the judiciary. The only place where you really don't have those issues is in a trial court bench, where you really are that first line in society, which where the rubber meets the road, mm -hmm. both in, in this people's business relationships, personal relationships, criminal issues, uh, local community issues, development of of uh, public law and, and, the, and the idea of developing of, uh, purposes and goals in society, that's really the trial bench. 
intermediate appellate courts, we're supposed to just decide a case. We're really not supposed to be making law. We're supposed to just decide is, is this significantly done correctly by the trial court or not. And then we're not supposed to be making great pronouncements. That's done by the senior appellate courts. In Texas, we have two. Of Oklahoma and us have two. Nobody else has two. But we have a Supreme Court and a Court of Criminal Appeals. I'm not knocking either one of them. That's our system. We've had it since 1846. Oklahoma, I don't know how long they've had it, but nobody else has it, so there's something in there for you. But uh, other than that, they should make those policy decisions. The intermediate public courts are really not policy-making bodies. And so the quicker we get those opinions out and decide the case for the people below in the court and get their stuff moving along, the better. And after a while, that becomes rather sameness, like it does in the legislature. You've seen these same issues, the same type of criminal appeals all the time. And generally, criminal appeals are done for purposes of delay, and everybody knows that. And so, uh, not much to be said. Same time, though, you wonder, is this one of those criminal appeals cases that looks like it's done for delay, but is there a significant question in here? Why is someone's rights really trampled on? So you'll have to read a record, you'll have to look at it, try to decide what you're doing. But even reading records in the appellate court business, if you've read enough transcripts and testimony, after a while, you begin to see, I began to be where I could begin to feel in reading a record when the error is fixing to occur. Two or three pages of testimony right. before you get to the error, you know it's coming because you can see how, right. you can feel the frustration in either the defense counsel or the prosecutor or you can feel the witness tightening up and the, or the judge getting a little tight in there. And so you can begin to know that something's fixing to happen that's right. going to turn this case one way or the other. So that that part's kind of interesting. People say, well, that's the worst reading the record. No, I like to read trial records because I've been a trial judge, so right. I kind of like put myself in that courtroom. You and can hear them. You can hear them, literally. Yes. That's right. Chuck, you just, you're back in that courtroom. Mm -hmm. You know where people are sitting. You kind of hear what's going on. That part I liked. But the mundane, the reality of it is it's very mundane to me. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never sat on a senior court. So that may be totally different. Where you are making policy decisions, and you are the last resort, and you only take one-tenth of the one-tenth that were ever appealed. So right. you're taking one percent of the total cases, you know, and you merely have them for a policy decision. That might be interesting. I mean, more interesting in the long run. I'm not saying the court wasn't interesting. It was. But over the long haul, after nine years, it would cease to be that interesting. So in between the humdrum, I'm sure you have some interesting stories. I know oh, yeah. at least one story in particular <laughs> that you were involved in somewhat. Oh, um, a lot? Yes. Yeah, well, George Lott, I'd, at the time, I didn't know I was involved in Lott's case, but it came up as a family law case. Now, for, for those who don't know historical purposes, George Lott is the first person in the United States history that we know of that attacked, that is shot up in appellate court. It had never happened in the history of the United States before that, that I know of, that I've ever heard about. Mm -hmm. We've had trial courts been shot up or been attacked, or in trial courts themselves and the judges of them, uh, and federal courts have been shot up and attacked. But as I was a family law judge, I used to, not often, but sometimes I'd get calls where I'd have to call home and give my wife a coat to take the kids and get out of the house because some fool was acting up in a family law way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to call rangers from time to time because they're supposed to provide protection for judges. So that's common. You, you expect that in a trial court, both criminal and then family courts in particular, you expect it. Appellate courts, no. So anyway, the, the idea about George Lott, it was my last day to sit in the appellate court, which was, I guess, July 1st, 1992 because I'd already announced my retirement. I was retiring, effective September 1st, 1992. And this was the last of that spring term of 1992. I think it was July 1st. But we weren't gonna sit for July and August. We're gonna take two months off, which is what I think we still do in the appellate courts in Texas. So we were gonna sit those two months, and this is the last time we were due to sit. I didn't wanna draw any more cases because I didn't wanna write those cases in the summer. So. I announced ahead of time, which is what you do, guys, I don't want to sit today. So it was a three-judge panel. 
and the judge panel was going to be me. I would have been presiding judge. <clears throat> on my left, on my right, would have been John Hill. And on my left would have been uh, Dave Ferris. So it would have been me in the center as presiding judge, John Hill on my right and Dave Ferris on my left. But I announced I wasn't going to do it. So John Hill moved up to be the presiding judge. This was before he was chief justice. He moved up to be the presiding judge that day. And on his right was David Ferris. And on his left was Clyde Ashworth. Clyde at that time was a former member of the court, but he had retired, and he was also our chief administrative judge for the 8th uh, Administrative Judicial Region of Texas. And he assigned, or the Supreme Court assigned him to sit as an appellate judge in my place. Literally, I hate to say it, but kind of as a warm body that day because we didn't have that many cases. The last day of, of, of the session, um, whatever cases I would have drawn, Clyde would draw them. Clyde had been on the court a number of years, knew how to write them as well as I did. Uh, he was happy to work that day, and I stayed home and had coffee with my wife. My last day to sit as a judge in that sense. And I still had cases to write, but I didn't want to draw three or four or five more to write in that two months. So I stayed home to have coffee, and I'm coming down to the courthouse, and it's like, I don't know, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, or maybe 10 or 11, and the courthouse is all cordoned off, and there's ambulances and police cars and stuff, and I wander into the Tarrant County Administrative Office building and ask them, what's going on? Oh, someone shot up the court. I said, what court? I hadn't heard a word. I hadn't listened to the radio or anything. Oh, they're over there killing people in the Court of Appeals. I said, what? Court of Appeals? It never happened. Well, I got on. I couldn't even get across the street. I found out what it was that someone had shot up the Fourth Court of Appeals. Boom. And, and, of course, the history will show later that there were two people killed in the court and, and uh, two judges were shot. John Hill, the presiding judge, was shot through his right shoulder, one of the first people shot. Clyde Ashworth, who said for me, had took two bullets, one in each hip. And Clyde had been a Marine in World War II and never been <coughs> combat wounded in any assault landing. And here in the Court of Appeals, he gets shot in each hip. And then a lawyer was shot, and then another lawyer uh, was shot, and he was killed in the courtroom. And then another lawyer from Dallas ran out of the courtroom to get help, and he was followed out and killed. No one knew who the guy was until later that day, and it turned out to be George Lott. And the people look up the history on that. He was so upset no one knew who he was that he went into a TV station to turn himself in, and they filmed him for about 30 minutes or so while he was confessing to all this. And his theory was he wanted to go to a Texas penitentiary uh, for killing judges. Now, the backstory is he didn't want to go to Illinois, where he was due to be tried for abuse, child sexual abuse on his son up in Illinois. And that trial was coming up later in September, I mean, later in August or, or July. And he knew he'd have to go up there. He knew if he went up, he'd be convicted. He knew if he's convicted, he'd be in an Illinois prison as a child sexual predator. You don't ever want to be that in a prison, period. I understand that's the lowest layer of whatever it is in a prison. Among prisoners, you're pretty low on life scale anyway, and you would be at the lowest of the lowest if you're a child sex offender. So he didn't want to do that. He wanted to go to the Texas penitentiary as a person who had killed judges in, in the name of justice. Now I think that through a little bit and the real irony of it, or I don't know. He goes down as a prisoner. He wants to be known as the man who kills judges, but he's the first guy ever shot up an appellate court. Now ask yourself, how come no criminal ever shot up an appellate court before? The only hope any prisoner ever has is what? An appellate an court. Appellate court. And you lot shot up an appellate court. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> Even among the prisoners, that didn't work out for him. But, of course, and he got the death penalty later. Fastest man in modern history of Texas to get it and was put to death. But he, it's okay, he, because he killed two, two, two lawyers and shot two judges and, and shot another lawyer in the courtroom. And uh, it was a cold-blooded, vicious plan to kill him. Okay, why'd he do it? His case... His divorce case had occurred in Fort Worth a year, two years before, maybe, and was on appeal. He had not prevailed in the divorce case. He had not been appointed manager conservator of his child. 
cleared it up because now he's wanted in Illinois for child predation. And apparently his former wife and child moved to Illinois. Somehow he followed, I don't know that story. But anyway, he was being charged with child abuse in Illinois, not Texas. The case had come up to the Fort Worth Court of Appeals in due course because he had appealed. Now he was a lawyer his own right, but he had been debarred because he inherited money from his father and didn't pay his bar dues. So there's something there, I don't know. You get disbarred because you don't pay bar dues? Come on, what's that about? But he represented himself in his appeal. And in the appeal, we should have stuck damages on him because if you make a purely frivolous civil appeal, you can be charged damages. We should have. So I wrote the opinion. I found out later because we went back and looked it up. I wrote the opinion where we affirmed the trial court pretty summarily pretty perfunctorily affirmed the trial court in a family law case, which is not that unreal, not unusual either. And we didn't charge Lot with any penalty. We should put a penalty damages on him for a frivolous appeal, but we didn't do that. He used that, that case somehow in his mind. That was where he got in all his family troubles with his kid or something. So that case bothered him enough. He wasn't shooting the court up for that case, it wasn't that day. The case had been decided months before, and I had been the one who wrote the opinion. So my name was on the opinion as Joe Spurlock, Justice. Well, to show he didn't know the difference between my dad, who had been on the court, and me, because he had the name in his pocket, my dad's name and my name, my dad's address and my address both, on a sheet of paper in his pocket. And so apparently he was going to go look for us or something if we weren't, if I wasn't. Whichever Spurlock he was looking for, and he didn't know which one it was, wasn't there on the Court of Appeals. But that was why he shot up the Court of Appeals, for retribution against the court, which had affirmed the trial court. He didn't go back and shoot up the trial court. He went and shot up the appellate court. He was a lawyer. He knew that there was no security in appellate courts, and he knew, he knew that it was, he knew about, how do you want to say it? dockets and he knew about the court was going to be ended that was the last right. time we were going to see it his last opportunity as he put it later for revenge or retribution before he you know went to the next stage in his life so he shot up the court so there was a, the, the connection was only made after the fact right he was not the one that ever acted out in that regard there was nothing untoward in his case that we looked at on the Court of Appeals, I mean, other than the fact that, yeah, he should have lost the case, but I don't remember any particulars of that case itself. I just that I authored the opinion, and that was it. So, uh, and, and it's still a mystery today uh, how that triggered him. But the thing about whatever Lot did triggered changes throughout the judicial system in the United States. That started all the courtroom security, uh, both in here and, and often and then it spread all over the state uh, with the uh, security in the courtrooms and of course that's about 11 years before 9-11 uh, uh, mm -hmm. so that was in 1992 nine years before 9-11 uh, so we had courthouse security from and after the lot incident throughout the Texas the courts of Texas and a lot of strong security been an appellate court shot up since then, so I guess it worked. I'm not making a joke because it's not jokeable, but it's just, you know, whatever it does, we were, he was just foremost among, I guess, the new wave of activists. It's not, that's an act of terrorism, of course, but it wasn't a terrorism as we tend to think of it in terms of uh, foreign invaders. That was, I guess, domestic terrorism. And that was the idea. He was uh, thinking he was going to take prisoners after he killed uh, Mr. Edwards out in the hallway, he just walked out of the courthouse. Nobody knew who he was or anything about him. No, he, he was even to look for him until he showed up at the uh, courthouse. Clyde Ashworth was not killed. He, he survived and he served for a judge for many years thereafter. John Hill came back on the court and served for many years thereafter. David Ferris was totally free. Ferris would have caught the two in the hip. Mm -hmm. John would have been not shot and I would have had John's bullet. So uh, you look at these but far things that as, oh, yeah. as life goes through. So Clyde got, got David's bullets and, and I got, I mean, John got mine. So David Ferris and I, who's also on this court, um, we, we 
walk scot free. That's how we don't know. Yeah. Interesting times. Well, I'll finish it up with one last question. Okay, sure. So, uh, with this diverse career, spending all that time on the appellate court, so what advice would you have for uh, an aspiring appellate justice or, or a judge today based on, based on your experience? Essentially, I think it comes back to where I started. Texas judiciary is political. Now, in theory, once you get to be a judge, it's non-political. But to be a judge, while we elect our judges, and although we elect them, still about 60% take office for the first time through appointment of either a governor or a county commissioner's court. Well, that's political too. Now, as long as we continue to elect judges, it is political. So I tell people, go through and, and look at how you can become known in your community, known politically, not particularly for political advices, but work in campaigns, become a worker in your community, do public service, be parts of service clubs, be interested in things, do your church or your synagogue or, or your mosque, whatever it is, be involved in the religious life of your community, be involved in the educational life, be involved in the school system. Do that, first of all. Secondly, appellate work, be prepared for. It is tedious work in the sense that, I said you read statements of facts and then you have to take a long list of citations and the problem about appellate law has been exacerbated, in my opinion, since I became an appellate court judge. Because at one time we put out I guess 70% of intermediate appellate opinions were never published, period. But because of the modern media publications and all, and because of one particular woman, Michael O'Connor, who was on the <laughs> Houston Court of Appeals, 14th, I think, Michael O'Connor, uh, who, by the way, O'Connor's uh, books, and, and, all, and they're great books. I mean, they're reference books, they're citation books, and, and uh, they're encyclopedias of the law. Um, she's created quite a publishing industry out of it. But Michael O'Connor was down on the Houston courts, a bright person, and I know her, and she, she really well. She got upset after I was off the court, Fort Worth court. She was upset at some of her judges, fellow judges down there on the court. There are two, uh, seven, nine judge, seven judge courts in, in Harris County, first and 14th. She got angry because she wanted to publish an opinion where she dissented from a panel opinion. It wasn't an en banc. If it had been en banc, you could do it. But she, she wanted to publish a dissent to a panel opinion she was not on. And, and, and she was denied, uh, the story goes, and she was denied the right to do so, and so she carried that issue all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reacted in a way untoward that I think they decided that all uh, intermediate appellate court opinions, they're going to take the non-published criteria away from them. Now, background even of that was more than just Michael Connor. She was the kind of the catalyst which, which drove the ball. The electronic media had been after him all along because I was on the court when we first got computers in 1985 or 86 in Fort Worth Court. We first got computers. Before that time, we had no computers. We did have a copy machine, because we'd gotten <laughs> that from my, from my dad on his court 11 years earlier, okay? We had copy machines. We didn't have computers till about 85 or 86. We got our first computers and all, so we got on it. And we were offered Lexus and Nexus services, and I forget who the other ones were. LexisNexis and the other electronic uh, service. We were offered their services if we would furnish them our unpublished opinions that they could put them out. And so it was really, at first, it was a really a, uh, a, an ethical issue. Could courts trade out unpublished opinions to receive free services from, from purveyors? I mean, the Supreme Court was got kind of in a flux about this and all, and, and as I said, I. Uh, uh, I was on the, uh, beginning in 1978, I was on the Judicial Council, and it was a problem for us. I was 20 years on the Judicial Council and 10 years as president, the last 10 years president of the Texas Judicial Council. And it was a problem for us. What, what would we do in the appellate court business? Could we trade with private vendors, state products, which are these unpublished court opinions? And they wanted them to fill up 
the electronic mm -hmm. data researching availability. Yeah. Well, the problem with unpublished opinions is they're unpublished for a reason. They're perfunctory. They were advisory. They were memographic. I mean, they were just memos. A lot of them you didn't spend a great detail. You didn't do all the heavy research that they wanted you to do. You wanted to decide the question. And then if it's a big enough question, then you got the Supremes or you got the Court of Criminal Appeals. And the intermediate appellate court's supposed to get that business going, keep the, keep the stuff flowing. Don't sit on it and write, you know, everything is a nut and a mimetus or something. That's not, that's not right. But uh, the media won their way. So now all lawyers, as you probably know, you have to wade through thousands of things that you should never even bother in order to get to that one nugget of law that you need to have because we are a system. My way of thinking, this electronic media is going to not transfer the law into an easier thing to do. It makes it more difficult and of course more expensive because now you have to use those services to find that law because we are a country. We work on stare decisis and we work in a principle of precedent. So precedent has stare decisis, that is it tends to bind people that follow that law. But when you publish all of these intermediate, unpublishable before opinions, you've got people out there who are not paying that much attention. They might be deciding the case, and it's decided essentially correctly, but the reasons they put in for deciding it can be all over the place without even any precedential value or basis otherwise. So it just makes, in my opinion, researching a lot harder than it used to be. Um, my opinion, the Supreme Court disagrees. We've had them now for, I don't know what, 15 years, I guess, we've had the unpublished opinions out. No distinction, many people place no distinction between them. Uh, they're, in fact, we're using all of the electronic citations nowadays, almost instead of the true citations for courts. And as a result, it's gonna be much more expensive and difficult for appellate lawyers in the future than it was in the past, before computers. Computers have made the business of appellate law more serious because you have to wade through more stuff than you ever had to. And therefore, I, that's all I see. I, I don't think it's a marvelous panacea of, of stuff for people now. It's a more difficult job. It used to be, you know, you waited and, and the latest opinions didn't come out for months because you waited in advance sheets, you read those, and then you waited till they were hard copy. And, and maybe we don't have time anymore for the law to develop that way, but the law develops judicial law, common law, develops incrementally. It's only the legislature which develops spontaneously. It should be. The legislature is more fast reacting to public policy and opinion. Judiciary should be more studied and, and take more time because you're making more permanent law that way. And therefore, we don't have that anymore in the judiciary. We have a reactive judiciary almost nowadays in the sense that all of these opinions are out there. If you're not careful, as an appellate lawyer, if you don't try to see whether or not that stuff and that opinion you're going to cite is dicta, that means it wasn't necessary for that opinion. Or if it has not been somehow held differently or for naught by some other intermediate court or even maybe later by some superior court that didn't pick up that and didn't have it cited right, you're going to be in deep trouble if you try to rely on that as precedent in the law. So either one, we're going to lose the precedential value of court opinions in this country, become more like civil law in Europe, which has the professors and uh, the legislature writing the law. Uh, America, we're in danger, I think, of losing our civil law, I mean our uh, common law, which doesn't bother ABA and some other people at all. That's political too. Sorry. No, absolutely. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. I really appreciate it. Let me run on. I appreciate that, Chuck. <laughs> kind of fun to do. You're a good listener. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>